Okay. Great. Good morning. And welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. This, mor uh, this morning, CPSC staff will brief the Commission on its work regarding carbon monoxide sensors and gas appliances. Since I arrived at the Commission four months ago, carbon monoxide poisoning from consumer products has been front of mind for me. Carbon monoxide is known as the invisible killer. It's odorless, colorless, and can, 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 uh, excuse me, can kill in minutes. Most recently, I've been talking with the public about winter safety and the need to be aware of carbon monoxide risks regarding portable generators. Today, we're talking about the same risk, but from a different source, the gas appliances we use inside our homes, especially furnaces and boilers. They're the second leading cause of non-fire related carbon monoxide deaths in the US. I look forward to hearing about CPSC's work in this space, the safety solutions that currently exist, and to explore the next steps we can take to prevent carbon monoxide poisoning in homes. Today, we have just one briefer, Ron Jordan, Program Manager and the Director of, for Engineering Sciences, and also in attendance are Mary Boyle, the Executive Director, Austin Schlick, General Counsel, and Alberta Mills, CPSC Secretary. Once Mr. Jordan has completed the briefing, each commissioner will have up to 10 minutes to ask questions with multiple rounds if necessary. I will now turn the gavel over to Mr. Jordan. Welcome. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, well, can hear you. Great. Well, welcome to CPSC. Uh, my name is Ronald Jordan, and I'm a mechanical engineer within CPSC's Directorate for Engineering Sciences. Um, I'm also the project manager for CPSC's gas appliance CO sensor project. And this morning, I'm gonna talk to you about what we're trying to accomplish in that project and also the status of those efforts. Next slide. Just to introduce you to what we're talking about. Um, the scope of this project includes uh, central gas furnaces, as you see in the left-hand side of your screen. Um, they're located typically in your basement or your attic, in crawl spaces, garages, um, practically anywhere. Um, and they're probably the most commonly used gas appliance, gas heating appliance, uh, followed by gas boilers. Um, this is an upright uh, gas boiler um, that you'll typically find in your basement. Um, a newer innovation in the gas appliance industry is the, uh, the picture in the middle are tankless gas boilers. And essentially they have a much smaller footprint than the, the traditional upright gas boiler. Um, they heat water just like the gas boilers, but they take up much less of a, a smaller footprint. Um, and you don't have the storage tank that you would use typically in a gas boiler. Um, they shouldn't be confused with gas water heaters um, as gas water heaters or tankless gas water heaters are used to heat water for hot water, whereas gas boilers uh, heat water to provide um, uh, comfort heat to the home. The last two products uh, are on your right hand side of the, of the frame. Uh, they include wall furnaces and floor furnaces. And unlike the first three, these are pretty much designed to heat the room that they're located in. And sometimes they, you may get uh, carryover heat to a, an adjacent room, but they don't provide central heating. Next slide, please. So the problem that we have with these products are that they are the second leading cause of non-fire uh, related CO poisoning deaths in the United States. Um, and the other part of that problem is that when you look at the U.S. voluntary standards that govern these products, that they don't have uh, provisions that protect consumers from known hazard patterns that cause or contribute to CO poisoning. And that's what we're here to address. Next slide. To, to understand the problem from an engineering standpoint, it's important to understand the root cause of the problem. 
at the root of this is whether or not the hydrocarbon fuels are bur burned completely. Um, uh, with these appliances, we're dealing with natural gas or propane. Uh, if you burn the fuel completely, then you'll have complete combustion and you shouldn't produce very much CO. The problem lies when you have incomplete combustion. Um, and when you don't have complete combustion, um, you're more likely to pr produce elevated levels of carbon monoxide. The other part of the problem, the other part of the root cause is that when a leakage path or mechanism exists or is created um, that allows the CO that's created through incomplete combustion to leak from inside of the appliance into the living space of a home, um, and then it comes into contact with consumers. And so when we look at the hazard patterns that we've seen in incidents um, involving uh, CO and gas appliances, these are the root causes that we see when we um, look at the incidents that have been reported to us or that we investigated. Next slide. Just to give you a visual of what some of these um, hazards look like or some of these um, failure mechanisms or root causes look like. Uh, to the left, we have a disconnect event. That's probably the most common uh, occurrence where you have um, either the vent that's designed to vent products safely to the outside of the house becomes disconnected. Um, that also happens when you have that type of uh, breach or opening in a masonry chimney um, and other parts of the flue passageways that are designed to, to convey the combustion products from inside of the, from inside of the appliance to the outside of the home. So anywhere along that path, if you have a disconnect, if you have an opening, if you have a breach, it creates a space for a product to leak from inside the appliance into the home and that causes problems. The other um, uh, very common failure mode that we see are block vents, partially block vents or chimneys. Um, and what happens there is, as you can see in this picture, you have a vent then an appliance that's venting into the masonry chimney. Sometimes um, if you don't line the chimney, um, the hot, the, uh, the water vapor from the hot gases will condense and cause the, uh, the mortar to decay inside the chimney, causing the bricks to, uh, uh, to collapse, causing a blockage. You have animals that build nests in the uh, in chimneys, uh, that'll cause a blockage. Um, you also have problems with both of these. Um, you have, you can have improper installation, improper maintenance. You can have product failure. We've had a uh, number of incidents where there have been failure of the actual vent material. Um, and so we recognize that there are a lot of different ways um, for a product to fail, uh, either through conditions that lead to incomplete combustion or conditions that, that cause um, that allow the, the combustion products to leak from the appliance into the living space. One thing that we'll be talking about is how our approach, regardless of the failure modes that the, the appliance may um, come up against, our approach deals with it by addressing the problem at the source of production of CO, and that's in the appliance. Next slide. Okay, and just to summarize um, what we're talking about, um, the hazard pattern is uh, carbon monoxide poisoning from gas appliances. Uh, we're focused on gas furnaces and gas boilers. Um, and the hazard patterns, um, again, are incomplete combustion, um, which can be caused by either not having enough combustion air to complete the combustion, having too much fuel, or uh, reducing the flame temperature at the burner, uh, quenching of the burner flame. Um, we also, I just went over the leakage staffs. And these are the things that we see when we look at incidents that we investigate. Next slide. Just to give you a feel for the impact of this problem, uh, sent between 2000 and 2018, um, there have been a total of 504 estimated CO deaths 
associated with these class of products that we're dealing with. That averages out to about 27 deaths per year. And again, that's between 2000 and 2018. Next slide. So what's the purpose? The purpose of this project is to reduce the CO deaths and injuries by improving the, uh, the performance requirements for the appliances. Again, we wanna deal with the problem at the source, make the, the products safer so that when any of these conditions occur, regardless of what the cause, um, that the product, that the appliance can deal with it and perform in a safe manner. Our statutory authority is the Consumer Product Safety Act. And just to give you um, a glimpse at some of the things that we're currently working on. Um, so we've been working to establish um, the expected lifespan of CO or combustion sensors or controllers when they're used in this harsh environment of a gas appliance. We've also, uh, we've been aware for a number of years of standards in Europe and Japan. And so we've been looking at what's been going on in those, uh, those parts of the world to see how they deal with the same very similar problems. And then ultimately our, our, our ultimate goal is to develop a uh, performance requirement that will help to reduce uh, the CO deaths and injuries. Next slide. So the relevant U.S. standards that we're dealing with and that we've dealt with over the years have been the ANSI Z21 set of gas appliance standards. Um, for the products that we're looking at, the specific standards are ANSI Z21.47 for gas-fired central furnaces, ANSI Z21.13 for gas-fired low-pressure steam and hot water boilers, and ANSI Z21.86 prevented gas fired space heating appliances. But the caveat there is that we're only focused on gas wall furnaces and gas floor furnaces. There are other types of products addressing that standard that we're not attempting to address because they do have um, provisions in place. Next, next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of background on this project, um, we've been engaged, um, actually we are, our engagement with the ANSI Z21 uh, set of standards go back to almost to the beginning of this agency, but in terms of the specific approach that we've used to address this hazard, uh, we've been dealing with um, the Z21 83 Technical Committee and a subordinate technical subcommittees for gas furnaces, boilers, uh, wall furnaces, and floor furnaces. So back in 2000, uh, we developed a proposal um, that was designed to mitigate this hazard. And the proposal essentially called for, um, it's important first to understand that there are combustion uh, emissions requirements in each standard that specify how much CO the, the appliance can safely produce. And for these products, that level is 400 parts per million um, in an air-free flu sample. Um, so that is the emission standard for these, uh, for these products. As it stands now, even though that, that's how they're required to perform, there's no mechanism or there's no means to ensure that once they leave the factory, that they will continue to uh, produce within the, the emission limits of a standard, the 400 parts per million. So uh, our first proposal, or the first part of our proposal, was to, to provide a means to limit gas appliance emissions to that standard limit of 400 parts per million. If that couldn't be accomplished, the, other, the next option would be to require a means to shut down the appliance uh, if it reached or exceeded um, the 400 parts per million. I'm gonna stop here because I see that my slides went away and I'll wait for those to come back.
Here we go. Okay. So I left off at um, the proposal uh, billet number two, which was to require a mean to shut off the appliance if the CO emissions uh, reach or exceeded 400 parts per million. And then the other option would be to require a means uh, for, the for the appliance's operation to be modulated to reduce the CO emissions um, to below 400 parts per million. The subparts of those two proposals were that, in addition to just looking directly at CO emissions, we also allowed for looking at other combustion conditions that cause CO emissions to uh, exceed 400 parts per million. So there are different ways to monitor the combustion process. So we weren't limiting our proposal to just CO monitoring, but there are other uh, parameters in combustion that you can look at and monitor and possibly can control that would help to control CO emissions. Next slide. Okay, so by way of further background, um, can you go back one slide, please? There you go. Um, just by way of background, further background, uh, so we made this proposal, and as an engineer, I understand that you would need some type of device or a sensor to mount to accomplish what was being done. And so we had done um, proof of concept testing back in 2001 and 2004, um, and then some additional testing as the years went by to demonstrate the concept of using a seal sensor um, or a combustion sensor in the appliance. The Z2183 Technical Committee uh, questioned the viability of sensors being used in that, in that environment. The, the major concern launched, this was back in 2005, was that there were no sensors that were commercially available that had the durability to survive in that environment and to last the expected lifespan of the appliance, which is estimated to be about 20 years. Um, well, Part of the efforts of the working group were designed to look into those things, um, um, but that's part of the background. Um, we've conducted uh, quite a bit of research uh, to look at these concerns, uh, and I talked about some of them earlier. Uh, we've contracted with a vendor to conduct the accelerated life testing of CO and combustion sensors in the, uh, the most severe conditions that they would encounter, uh, their stressors. Uh, we also uh, contracted with another vendor to conduct an impact study of uh, the impact of CO sensors, combustion sensors, and gas appliances in Europe and Japan. Next slide. So for years, we've uh, known that there are international standards that have very similar um, CO shutoff uh, provisions that we've proposed uh, back in 2000 and then again in 2015. Um, they are the, uh, the Japanese industrial standards, GIS, um, for gas burning water heaters, hydronic heaters, which are, are boilers, those are gas boilers, and gas space heaters. Uh, also, um, the Committee for European Standardization, um, they have a couple of standards for gas boilers, for domestic gas boilers, and also a standard for combustion product sensing devices that would be used in those uh, boilers or other appliances. So they, uh, these international standards demonstrate pretty much what we've been pushing for the last 20 plus years. Um, that it can be done, it has been done in Europe and Japan. Next slide. So, and here are a few examples of gas appliances um, from Europe and Japan um, that are equipped with CO and combustion sensing devices. 
a number of these we've acquired ourselves uh, for examination. Um, so you have uh, tankless gas water heaters, which are very similar. They're uh, very similar to uh, gas boilers. The only difference, the combustion process is the same. It's just what your demand is, which load is, uh, how much water do you want to heat and for what purposes. But in terms of the basic operations of the appliances, uh, these products are all pretty much the same from a combustion standpoint and from a technology standpoint. It's just how do you decide to use the appliance? Do you want to heat water for hot water or do you want to heat water for um, for comfort heating? Um, so they have uh, units equipped with seal sensors as well as combustion controllers that accomplish that by uh, monitoring the air fuel ratio of the uh, combustion process. Next slide. So I, I said I was going to provide a status, and this is it, that, that back in 2018, we were approved um, to work on an AMPR, uh, which me and my project team did. Uh, the uh, AMPR was published in the Federal Register in August of 2019. Um, the Commission approved uh, my project to work on NPR uh, in the FY22 performance budget request. Uh, however, during the uh, operating plan hearings for the FY22 operating plan, uh, the Commission uh, changed our NPR deliverable to a uh, data analysis technical review which we've been working on. Uh, we continue our efforts to develop documents through this DATR that would be needed for NPR. And we, we continue to work with the Z21 uh, set of technical committees and, and technical subcommittees. Um, we do plan to propose um, to the commission um, that NPR uh, would be pursued in the FY23 operating plan. Next slide. Just want to quickly introduce you to my project team. Uh, I'm the project manager. Uh, Mr. Brett Griffin uh, from the director of, uh, for, I'm sorry, from the director of economics. Uh, Lynn Wang from health sciences. Uh, Matt Natoff from epidemiology. Tim Smith also from uh, engineering sciences and then Dave DiMatteo from the Office of General Counsel. But we've all been working diligently to get the work done. But thank you for your time. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. And thanks to your team as well. Uh, at this point in time, we're gonna to turn to questions from the commissioners. Um, I mentioned 10 minute rounds with um, multiple rounds if necessary. Tell me. 10 minute question box with multiple rounds if necessary. I'm gonna start with myself. Um, and um, Mr. Jordan, thank you very much for, for presenting today and the work that you've been doing. Uh, I would say, as has been said, carbon dioxide is an invisible killer. And sadly, it's one that can kill not just one person when an appliance fails, but entire households. I re was recently reading a report about seven members of a household in Moorhead, Minnesota, who died of carbon monoxide poisoning uh, from a malfunctioning furnace just days before Christmas. And it, it's an entire family who's gone in an instant. And these are the type of horrific events that we as an agency must try and prevent. Um, there have been assertions made that the sensors required to detect carbon monoxide conditions won't work as needed in these systems. Um, seems like your staff's research contradict that is that consistent with what you were finding yeah that that's been our experience um our research to date indicates other ones um we've conducted uh sensor testing uh to demonstrate durability um uh, and diffusibility um and we also know that there are as i mentioned in my presentation that there are european and japanese standards that are dealing with very similar issues. Um, the combustion process isn't that much different. There are some design differences, 
but they've been able to overcome um, what I would expect to be the same types of problems encountered here in this country. So I, I don't believe that's the case, um, that they're not unreliable. I think that the evidence in Japan and Europe kind of speak differently to that. And going to that, uh, if I looked at your slide correctly, it seems like the, the Jap first Japanese standard was put in place around 13 years ago. How long has it been in place in Europe? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, I only know, um, I, I don't know the uh, age of the European standards for boilers. I know that the standard for the sensing device um, became effective in I believe it was 2014 to 2016 time frame, but the standards for boilers have been in place for much longer than that. But I, I don't have the actual time frame for that. So it's, it's been in the marketplace for quite some time. Sounds like, um, with respect to the the U.S., do any of the voluntary standards in these products? Um, do they apply uh, to the carbon monoxide kinds of sensing that, that you're talking about in the European? Are you asking if the, whether the European standards can be used in uh, the US? Asking, Currently in the US standards, the voluntary standards that exist out there, do they address any of the carbon monoxide problems that, that you're seeing and that we're talking about today? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you at first. Oh. Um, they they don't we don't feel that we don't believe that they adequately address uh, the seal issues that we face here in this country. Uh, they do address one uh, failure mechanism and that's uh, totally block vents, but they don't address other things that, which are very common, uh, such as disconnected vents, um, depressurization of a room, snow blockage of a sidewall vented appliance. Um, and historically, back in the uh, early to mid 80s, there was actually disconnected vent coverage in the furnace standard, and that was removed. Um, so they don't have any effect um, provisions currently in the standards. And when we look at the incidents that are that we investigate, we see those we see the uh, consequences of that. And because we see modern appliances with the modern um, uh, devices and equipment on it still being involved in CO poisoning incidents. You know, going back to the family I was talking about, it was, it was mother, father, four kids, and their uncle all died in one night. And this has been going on far too long. Um, I know you talked about the uh, FY23 plan, but would it be possible to accelerate um, the the NPR and get done in this fiscal year if the commission directed so? Yes, it's Dwayne. Oh, I'll defer that to the management. I'll take that one. Uh, so yes, if uh, if direction to the staff changes, uh, we can submit an NPR to the commission this fiscal year. Uh, uh, staff continued to work on uh, on this area as directed by the commission, although some staff resources were shifted uh, given the lack of an NPR deliverable in the current operating plan. But yes, we can uh, we can submit an NPR this year if that direction changes. Thanks, Dwayne. Thanks, um, Jordan. Uh, those those are my questions. Um, turning to uh, Commissioner Biacco. Okay, I'm on now. Mr. Jordan, it's nice to meet you. I don't think we've had a chance to meet along the way. Um, and I appreciate all your work and introducing um, us to your team. Uh, and let's start with that very issue. So understand that, you know, one of the reasons I personally supported um, changing the NPR to a, a technical analysis is that I came in 2018. Uh, it sounds to me like you guys have been working on this for 22 years plus and I don't have a background. So I do have probably more questions than, than some people do. And it's not to question what you or your team has been doing. They're just questions that I don't have answers to yet. So if you'll bear with me. Um, and, and I know you mentioned something and I guess really proving my point that 
in the mid eighties, there was one standard and you know, now we have, we had a different standard in 2000 we have a different standard now. And so before we have the NPR out there, I, I'd like to know um, what exactly we're dealing with right now, because in 2000, we were still using typewriters. Um, and I, I don't know if many things have changed. I just don't know if many things have changed since then. So let's, let's start with um, one of the things, and I'm going to jump all over the place because right, I was scribbling here. One of the things that you said, um, and this is in no particular order, were the hazard pattern are conditions that cause CO poisoning. Um, conditions, if I understand correctly, are not necessarily the boiler or the furnace, correct? The actual product. No, it runs the gamut. It can include the product and it can also include the vent systems. So the family that that um, the chairman was referring to, I mean, nobody wants CO poisoning for anybody, not one single person. The family he was referring to, though, was that those deaths, were they caused by the product or the conditions, like a block vent or uh, you know, a maintenance issue? Well, I, I haven't had a chance to review that incident, so it would be probably in, inappropriate for me to speak to that one, but I can speak in general that, you know, you don't have a, um, a complete installation uh, of a gas appliance that's designed to be vented unless it's properly vented either through a vent pipe or to a masonry chimney to, to safely remove those products to the outside of the dwelling. Um, so the conditions uh, come along with the products um, that that they're part of the installation environment that the product has to operate in and that have to be in proper order in order for the product installation to be whole and to be appropriate. Okay. So if you if you don't if you don't install the vent system properly in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and the local building code, you don't have a valid installation. You don't have a safe installation. Okay, I get that. So let's assume we have a safe installation um, and then the vent breaks later or uh, something else occurs. I think you, you, the example you gave was snow piling up on the side of the house and blocking that vent. So you can have a complete proper installation, but there are conditions beyond the product and the installation that um, cause, for example, um, you know, uh, CO poisoning in the house. Is well, that that's true, but again, but again, the the vent pipe, the, the furnace installation or the boiler installation is not complete or safe unless it's properly vented to the outdoors through the use of, an, of a vent pipe or a chimney. Um, some of the conditions that lead to these tragedies, some of them are associated with the vent pipe or the chimney, but some of them that the ones that tend to lead to the incomplete combustion are the things going on within the appliance. Right, Either there's too much air. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to drill down on, trying to get a better understanding. Because over an 18-year period, we had you know about 27 deaths. As Alex pointed out, there were households, so it would be in you know situations versus um, individual deaths. Like you know, I think the one he was talking to was one household with several deaths, so that number would would vary. And I'm trying to figure out how many of those were caused by the product itself or something outside of the product, like a blocked um, air vent, even with an appropriate insta installation. That, that's all I'm trying to get a, a feel for. Um, right. Yeah. And, and I guess um, I, I don't have that breakdown in and front that's of okay. me. Uh, but I, I will say this, that, that we don't disassociate the condition of the vent from the appliance, because even though the vent may become disconnected, if you're producing uh, dangerous levels of CO inside the appliance, that's where the problem lies. And okay. also, even if you have a properly operating appliance, when you start leaking um, combustion products into the um, atmosphere, you can start depleting the oxygen, which is going to okay. foul up the combustion even more. Um, that's 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 so exactly what I'm asking about. So that's helpful. I, I get that's okay. that's what I get to. Um, on that on that issue, and Alex cut me off when my time is up because I have an entire page of questions that maybe somebody else will ask. The CO admissions that you refer to, the 400 parts 
Is it PPM? I didn't write that down. Okay. Yes. It, the emissions themselves, and, and maybe this is not an appropriate question for you, but isn't that an EPA issue versus a product issue, or am I wrong about that? No. Um, so there are a number of agencies that have different involvement um, that have overlapping or cross-cutting um, activities. Um, so for product safety, this is clearly a product issue and it's a CPSC issue because it okay. goes to the uh, health and safety of consumers. And so the operation of that appliance, um, whether it's produced in 400 parts per million or 40 or 4,000, that goes to the appliance and the uh, standards that are designed to make that product perform safely. Okay, got it. And do the other agencies who have overlapping jurisdiction, are they with us on the, are, are the standards all the same, 400 parts per million? As being no, well, see, or unsafe? Well, this is, the 400 parts per million is part of the uh, the voluntary standard. They're, they're not government standards. Okay, I missed that. Um, but um, do, do we have an idea of what the other agencies say as far as what is, a quote unquote safe or not safe um, number there, the 400 points parts per million. Right. Um, no, I think that EPA, I, I don't want to speak for them. I, actually, I'll, I'll defer that to somebody from okay. EPA, but I, I just know that generally speaking, they deal with indoor air quality from a number of sources and, and Carbon monoxide is just one of multiple things that affect indoor air quality. Um, so they deal with it from a holistic standpoint. They're looking at any pollutants that can be in the indoors. Um, and that's the uh, overlap with us. Whereas okay. we're focused on the uh, operate, the safety and the operation of the okay. appliance. Okay. Um, and that's, that's helpful. Um, one of the things that I know um, I, I've been I have a strong feeling about, and some of the other commissioners do as well, um, is how long it's taken the agency to address issues in front of them. Um, and like in this case, you're talking about, you've been doing this since the 2000, early 2000. Why did the agency, was there a reason why no um, voluntary standards were put in place to address this, or the agency hasn't taken any steps in that 22 years? Do, do you know? Right. Um, so we're, we're, as you know, uh, we're required to work uh, through the volunteer standards uh, process, which we've been doing. Um, we've uh, made two proposals, uh, the first in 2000, and we've supported it with test uh, documentation, incident data, things like that. Uh, we worked each time we made a proposal, the, um, the technical committee would establish a working group to examine our proposal. And those were, those working groups uh, were in operation for about three to four years. Um, so going back to 2000, they established the working group in 2002. We spent the next three to four years working on our uh, objectives for that working group. Unfortunately, that that effort ended um, with the Z21 techno the Z2183 technical committee disbanding that working group. Uh, the concern that was raised back then was that, well, they don't have a lifespan of the durability of the appliance. So we, we conducted some testing um, in the following years to address that issue. Uh, we wrote a report, we shared it with industry. Um, so now we're up into, uh, I think it was 2012, by the time we finally published that report. Uh, we continued, we stayed engaged with the industry through the voluntary standards. Um, we weren't seeing anything happening, so we uh, we um, called for a, uh, a request for information back in 2014. We were trying to get gather information from all stakeholders um, that might know anything about this issue, including the gas appliance industry. Uh, we held a forum to discuss those concerns in 2014. Okay. Um, and then in 2015, uh, because nothing had happened in terms of uh, standard development, we wrote another proposal, we okay. submitted it. Uh, the technical committee, um, once again, established another working group. We spent about three to four years working on our objectives. Uh, we, in, in 2019, 
uh, the, te the technical committee disbanded that working group. And unfortunately, again, without developing a standard, again, without doing uh, work that might be necessary to give them a better comfort level or understanding of the problem or how to address it through sensors. So yeah, it, it, when you look at it just from a timeline, it's like, wow, that's a long time. But when yeah, you're in the trenches, <laughs> what's going on from the beginning yeah. up through the current, um, you can so, kind of I, see look, how... I've, I've seen this uh, this um, standard drag for you know these standards committees drag. What's the big objection? Has it been the same since 2000 to today? Is it the same? And Ms. Jordan, if you can answer that quickly because time has run and I'm happy. I'm sorry, to Alex. No, 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 not at all. I'm happy to go for another round, but I just didn't want to let the other commissioners talk as well. I'm sorry. No, these are great sure. questions. So, Commissioner Biak, I appreciate them. Um, Ms. Gerard, did you want to answer that one quickly, um, or we can come back to it in the next round if you think it's a longer answer? Right. So, when we published the AMPR uh, and we got responses from industry, um, they did raise a lot more additional uh, concerns um, beyond what was raised back in 2005 about the lifespan. Um, I think a lot of them, they're, they're very addressable and they have been addressed. Uh, but the primary issue has been the lifespan. They want sensors to last the life of the appliance. Uh, so for a year, that, that's I'm the sorry. major concern and the major obstacle as I see it. Thank okay. you, Mr. Short. Um, thank you, Commissioner Biacco. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to yield some of my time back to uh, Commissioner Biacco if she has additional questions. It'll take a couple rounds, so go ahead, Peter. Maybe you'll okay. have some uh, Mr. Jordan, thank you for the presentation today. Uh, th this was, was comprehensive, and frankly, when the commission's engaged in, in, in rulemaking, coming forward with a mandatory standard on uh, performance requirements, this is the format and, and, and the way forward that we should always engage in. Uh, having an opportunity to hear from you and hear what your staff is doing, uh, and to have this kind of public discourse where we've got an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, and, and again, I think this is the first time that uh, that, that you and I are having a, a chance to sit down in a forum like this. So, Mr. Chair, I appreciate you uh, making staff available to answer questions about the, the, the work and the research that they've been up to. Um, taking backing off of uh, uh, questions that I heard uh, Commissioner Biacco ask in, in, in the presentation, uh, it sounds like one of the, the key issues and, and hurdles historically has been this question of technical feasibility. Uh, with respect to the sensors and this is dating back uh uh you know 20 years plus um you know going back to those discussions in 2000 2004 era uh do we have documentation that relates to the ANSI committee's questioning of the the viability of the sensors um to be used to to, to measure appliances exhausts yes it would be found in the meeting minutes and, and okay. my uh, actual staff meeting log as well. Okay. Um, Coming to this issue somewhat fresh, you know, this, this is sort of uh, uh, you know historical context that 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 we're lacking right now. If you guys have those meeting minutes available, is that something? Uh, and I see that 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 uh, Dwayne's uh, on the on the uh, Mr. Boniface is on the uh, uh, call. Is is that something that you're able to make uh, available to us? Yes, those are Absolutely. publicly posted. Those are publicly posted on our website, the uh, the, the CPSC meeting logs, so we can uh, pull those together and send those. If you can pull them and share that, that would be that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, sorry, were you? In the presentation, there were uh, pictures of a disconnected vent and a blocked vent uh, or, or a chimney. Um, when we track these incidents, do we know how frequently? uh the the, the the these types of issues are responsible setting inside the actual go-to meeting you have to change i'm sorry all right i think somebody else is talking um, please mute if you are not uh speaking uh not supposed to be speaking thank you so when we're tracking the incidents how frequently are, are uh these types of issues responsible uh yeah disconnected or, or, or blocked vents responsible for the injuries that are recorded and and are, are we tracking how many of these you know, vent issues are the result of, uh, uh, you know, 
consumer misuse or uh, installer error? Um, I, I believe I'd have to go back and look at some of the old reports, but I, I know that we looked at those types of things. Um, I don't know if we were keeping a tally as to how many were consumer misuse or how many were product failure, um, but it wouldn't be too difficult to do that, I don't think. Okay. Um, so just, just to add on to that, if I may, um, it, it, again, what, what we are looking at trying to do is trying to address the production of unsafe carbon monoxide levels at the source. Uh, and so whether or not the uh, leak at the uh, at the furnace or at the boiler or through the vent or, or so forth, we're really concerned about the generation of unsafe uh, uh, carbon monoxide levels uh, above that 400 uh, parts per million. I, get that. I understand that. I think we're trying to take a look at the global picture in which the, the hazard pattern is, is manifesting itself and, and trying to, uh, you know, understand the full context of what's going on in these incidents. And to that end, you know, as you're tracking incidents, has, has staff compiled a, a list of, you know, IDIs or other, uh, 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 you know, incident reporting where uh, where we've taken a look at, at, at the vent issue? Yes. No, we, we have, um, we've done a couple of reports where we've um, reviewed incident reports to determine what the failure modes and mechanisms were. And, and in that case, we would tally them, um, like, okay, this percentage were block vents, this percentage were disconnected vents. Um, we haven't done one of those in a while, but we uh, but we have a couple of those. Um, and of course, Is everything that we do- Is it your sense that changed enough that those, um, that, that those older incidents would still be valid and paint a, a, a useful picture of what's happening? A absolutely. Um, uh, a number of years ago, when we first proposed this, industry uh, took the position that, well, these incidents were only occurring with older appliances. And older is defined as appliances that were built before um, some of the more modern uh, safety standards went into effect. So that would be um, products that were built and certified prior to 1990. Um, okay. But what we found is that when we looked at our incidents, we were seeing a number of um, cases with new appliances with the new safety equipment in them that were still uh, have, being exposed or still experiencing failure and resulting in seal poisoning. Because um, again, the only um, provision that's gone into a place universally are the block vents, which is for a totally block vents. Um, I don't know. I don't believe they address partially blockage, partial blockage of a vent or a chimney. Uh, I, I also do work in sections. Well, no, I'll, 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 I'll steer away from that. Um, but we are aware of cases um, in a different different venues where we see these types of failures with newer appliances. Okay, if we've got that incident data, that would be useful again for the commission to take a look at, so we can, you know, start tallying uh, what, what we've seen and, and how that sort of informs the commission's decision making going forward. Uh, separate question: uh, Are there are there other standards that deal with exhaust and venting? From the appliance or from the material, the the vent products. I suppose both, um, and, and, and absent sort of uh, uh, you know industry standards, uh, you know, it, it, are there separate local building code provisions that 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 get specifically at you know vent installation, uh, you know, how to avoid the, right. uh, uh, the 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 snow buildup problem that you cited, um, you know, with respect to vermin and uh, and animal infestation uh, materials with respect to uh, 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 you know brick mortar and grout. Right, so uh, so there are local building codes, um, and typically in the manufacturer's installation instructions, they'll instruct the installer to install it in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and also the local building codes. I mean, I think that's fairly boilerplate uh, in a in an installation standard. Um, 
So have we canvassed the local building codes to make sure that those are sufficiently robust to start avoid uh, to, to to avoid you know some of the issues that you cited with respect to uh, chimney collapse and and you know blockage from rodent infestation or you know the the, the very apt uh, uh, example that you gave about uh, snow pile up with the side vent. Right. But years ago we were um, involved in the model codes and there may be some staff that are currently involved with it. But the approach for this particular project that we've taken is, because uh, I think the, the, I'll say the beauty of this proposal is that regardless of what the cause, what the leakage path or mechanism is, what the internal failure mode that causes the appliance to generate dangerous levels of CO that by, we felt that we can cut through a lot of that and overcome a lot of that by addressing the problem at the source of production. If, if you can monitor the source of production and provide some type of response, either shut off or modulating to keep the um, emissions low, it doesn't matter um, what happens. It's it's almost like the uh, the Dutch boy uh, and the dike um, analogy where the, the Dutch boy is trying to plug the uh, the dike, but there's one plug, but there are multiple leaks. So we're so our approach addresses it from a multifaceted approach, regardless of where it leaks from or what causes it to um, produce CO, that if we can address it at the source, we should be able to stop the problem. And that's been our approach and that's been our focus. I appreciate that. Uh, again, this was a, a good overview and I appreciate the work and the presentation today. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. And I remind everybody again, if you're not talking, please mute yourselves to avoid feedback. Uh, Commissioner Trumpka. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Ronald, thank you for the presentation and for your persistent work in this area over the years. Um, you know, I think the, the one thing that I wanted to address, staff's been asking the voluntary standards body <clears throat> to address this through voluntary standards for 22 years, and that hasn't happened. And it seems like the only uh, explanation or the only resistance from the voluntary standards body is that they weren't sure if the sensor can hold up over the 20 year lifespan of a product. So at the outset, I hate this, I hate to point this out, but if they had set this thing up and let it run when you first asked, they would have known by now. But aside from that, there's been a there's been a lot <clears throat> of evidence that seems to undercut that from the fact that the Japanese and the Europeans have been regulating this for a long time and those those sensors have been running and have held up. But it also looks like staff addressed this directly and dismissed the, the concern. Uh, and you alluded to this before, and, I, and from the briefing materials, it looks like the, there was a durability for, for sensor, um, sensors tested from 2007 to 2008, and staff, quote, found that the sensors under test were durable enough to survive within a gas furnace throughout its lifespan. And that was 2007, 2008 testing. Can you expand on what you did and how they haven't accepted uh, that decade plus old finding? Right, and I'll try to be brief, but after um, after the working group was disbanded back in 2005, uh, we set about to uh, find out what individual manufacturers were concerned about uh, and how could we go about testing and establishing the durability of sensors in this application. Um, one of the outcomes of those interactions was that, well, there's a, um, a corrosion test that's used to accelerate the uh, life of the metal parts in the appliance, whether it's a heat exchanger or a vent system, because uh, corrosion of, any, uh, of metal materials was a problem early on, and sometimes it still comes up as a problem, um, but that was a problem in the gas appliance industry. And so this test was one mechanism to accomplish that. So we did testing where we had sensors in that environment because that was considered probably the most robust, harsh environment beyond, above and beyond what they would normally uh, experience because we were, um, the test called for burning of the fuel air mixture 
along with hydrochloric and hydrofluoric uh, acid being injected into the process to, to promote corrosion. Uh, the sensors were subjected to that environment. Um, we did uh, pre-testing where we tested sensor performance before that testing in the furnace. And we did post-testing where we tested the sensors after that uh, testing in the furnace with all these acids. And the uh, performance didn't drop off much. We still uh, were able to get uh, reliable um, um, proportional signals uh, from the sensors. So that was an indication that they were still working from that environment. We shared that information with the uh, with the technical committee and its uh, and its various uh, standards groups, and they um, I had to go back and look at that report or look at some of the responses. Um, but that kind of led to led into us doing the um, the forum in 2014 because we're still engaging back and forth, still participating with the voluntary standards. Um, I, I don't recall. I'd have to go back and look at my notes to see. Uh, why they didn't move on that but we continued to move and so we didn't really wait for them to uh say hey we're going to do it. we continued to stay engaged with them um and then the only way to revive it was to make the new proposal which we did in 2015. thank you i all of my questions have have been addressed perfectly thank you very much you know i i think that the, the only other thing that I would say is that um, I don't think there can be any complaint that we haven't given the voluntary standards body enough time to address this. So uh, I'll yield back the rest of my time. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Trumka. Uh, I know that Commissioner Biakko has additional questions. I'm going to ask one question for, or for a clarification um, before turning back to Commissioner Biakko. Um, so my understanding from, from what you're saying about how the CO sensors work and the safety mitigation is, as the sensor detects higher levels of carbon monoxide in the, the atmosphere, it will then either turn off the furnace or re reduce the, the, um, the amount of uh, you know, the operation of, of the device. So um, regardless of why the, the CEO levels are increasing, whether it's a block vent from, you know, snowpack, which may be separate from the appliance at all, or a or, or problem with the appliance itself, he can identify that there's rising levels that could be hazardous and, you know, lethal, um, and then take preemptive action to stop that from happening. Is, is that, my, is my understanding of what the the sensors and the technology would do and, and are in Japan and Europe? Yeah, that, that's correct. That they either directly detect CO or they detect the combustion conditions and respond to those. So, but yeah, you're, you're spot on. So it's, it, it's less really an issue of whether it's the vent that's being blocked, whether there's a, you know, the mortar's not going or whether the housing standards are right as opposed to there is safety technology that can be incorporated into these devices that whatever the reason um, if there is a dangerous level of CEO that's in the household or nearby that the sensor um, then then action will be taken to mitigate the amount of CO that's being produced by that device. I think I'm just saying the same thing over again, but if I'm if I'm generalizing this correctly, can you just confirm that? I can confirm that you are internalizing it correctly. <laughs> you have a good grasp of it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that in your work, Mr. Jordan. Um, that's my questions. Uh, Commissioner Biakko, did you have more questions? I, I do, just so I understand, I, and I'm following so far. Um, the, the products in Japan and Europe are, is, I mean, I know you've said many times that they are similar. We expect it to perform the same. It's pretty much the same. What's really the difference um, as to why it's working in those countries um, and, and we're not using it here? And what is the big difference or what is the um, objection uh, to using this technology? And is it a technology or is it something that's been around? Well, the, the primary issue, again, is that 
the 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 gas appliance industry or the standards development group uh they believe that the sensor should last the life of the appliance that has been the the biggest and most consistent objection that i've heard over these years can't they um, be replaced excuse me can't they be replaced i mean if the sensor fails before the um, furnace does isn't there can't they just be replaced oh ab absolutely um they can absolutely be replaced um i've heard comments this... that i'm sorry no keep going no that i mean for the he cut out you cut out okay that there's not they're not much different than some of the other common devices um that you'll find in appliances um that have to um look into the bulkhead of say a heat exchanger or some compartment that essentially it's it's typically two screws and a gasket material and then you have the connection wire um that provides the um the power to the, the to the device and then the signal from the device, but it, it's really not complicated at all um, and very similar to existing devices in terms of okay. replacement. And so, what's the cost? Is that an issue? Well, I, I would have to defer to our economists, and uh, we haven't looked at all the yeah, cost issues. For us. What, what are the I'm sorry. I don't want to. I don't need an economic analysis. I'm trying to get an understanding of is as the are the committee saying it's too expensive. In addition to it, it's taking. You know, we don't know about the lifespan of the sensors, and do we have an understanding of what these sensors cost? I, I haven't really heard very many cost issues raised at the uh, volunteer standards committees. And one thing, as a rule, they they don't discuss cost issues at these meetings. Okay. Um, so I just want to uh, be clear on something. You referred to these several times as, as gas appliances, and earlier you mentioned that water, hot water boilers don't have this issue. Are we really focused on just gas furnaces and boilers that heat the house, and that's it? It's that little box of products? Right. Um, that's correct. Uh, if we look at the data, the incident data, and and we attempt to be data driven and when we look at the trends uh somebody mentioned generators uh, they've overtaken furnaces and space heaters as a leading uh, cause of co deaths um so we've uh, been focusing on furnaces and boilers because that's what, where we see most of the deaths um, there are other appliances um that um i'll just anecdotally been at space heaters um Years ago, they were the leading cause, along with furnaces, of CO poisoning deaths. Now, one thing that they've done that's uh, been very proactive and very um, a positive uh, approach is that they uh, introduced something known as an oxygen depletion sensor um, and unvented space heaters. And they also use vent safety shutoff switches, which are designed to detect a disconnected vent and some of the Bennett space heaters. And so whereas those were leading causes of CO deaths uh, years ago, uh, they know they barely um, make it on the radar because they took a, a, a positive approach to dealing directly or indirectly with the issue. And that is CO poisoning. Okay. So I don't mean research, but I, I just have a uh, maybe a dumb question. Doesn't a plug-in CO detector in the home uh, accomplish the same thing that these sensors would? Yes and no. Um, okay. Yes, it does monitor CO, but it has no impact on the operation of the appliance. And okay. so just as I mentioned that the Venet space heaters, now you they barely um, register on our, on our incident tracking as causes of CO deaths because of the, the measures that they took through the standards and then through technology that came to the market. Uh, units that were equipped with either safety shutoff switches or oxygen depletion sensors. 
So now they are no longer um, leading causes of CO poisoning. I feel the same way with furnaces that if, if we're trying to make the appliance safer and then dealing with that those group of voluntary standards, that's the relevant uh, okay. area of, of coverage. Now, so let me tell you, I'm sorry, go ahead. So my question was dumb. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I get the difference now. And let me just say say this and then I'll, I'll quit because the rest of my questions are just details. Um, I personally, and in this position as a commissioner, I, I am losing patience um, with the um, amount of time it's taking and the delays with the voluntary standards. I personally believe that voluntary standards can be very effective if you get them into place. But if there is a if there is 22 years that have gone by and there's not a single standard that is going, as far as I'm concerned, that does not adequately address the problem. Um, not that there isn't one, the fact that there isn't one and that we haven't gotten there uh, does not adequately address the problem. So uh, to those people out there on the committees who might be listening, um, and for what it's worth, that's where I am on all of this. Um, assuming, of course, that the proposals for a new voluntary standard, whether on this product or any other product, are technically feasible and, 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 sh and something that we need to address, and it would make the product safer. Um, so that, that's my little policy comment, and I appreciate you taking the time to answer all of my questions. I know they were very tedious. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bianco. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Commissioner Feldman, do you have further questions? Thank you. Uh, just to say that I, I agree with Commissioner Biacco. Uh, I, I too am open to a path forward on, on, on this issue. Uh, uh, no further questions. I did want to state, um, you know, in my first round, I asked uh, for some follow-up information on, uh, on uh, industry's concerns about feasibility that were raised uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and then I asked for uh, summation of some of the incident data with respect to, um, you know, how uh, chimney and e e exhaust issues uh, uh, may be manifesting themselves. Um, when you send those up, uh, if I could request that uh, they be sent to all my colleagues, I want to get past having information come from staff to the commission uh, in a siloed manner as had been the practice under previous agency leadership. We all need to be operating off the same set of facts and information here in order to make good decisions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we'll work to get uh, the information the commission needs. Uh, out Thank there. you, and thanks for holding this today. Bye-bye. It was helpful. Uh, Commissioner Trumka, did you have any further questions? No more questions. Just again, uh, Dwayne, Ronald, thank you to you and your team for the work on the issue. So with that, um, First, I want to thank the staff for this informative briefing and for the work that they've been doing. And also, uh, I agree with what a number of my colleagues have said, that this is uh, a very useful discussion to have. I think, uh, and I appreciate the commissioners for actively participating in this. Um, you know, as a, as a final note, and this goes a little bit back to what Commissioner Biaco was saying, um, a Clearly, this is an issue that we need to move forward with to try and figure out how best to, to protect consumers. But as we're moving forward, I would urge everybody who is who's viewing to make sure that you have working carbon monoxide detectors in your homes and the homes of your loved ones. Um, also, think about changing the batteries in your carbon monoxide and smoke alarms uh, when you change your clocks for daylight savings time in a few weeks. Um, it really could save you and your entire family. So with that, thanks again to everybody and uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.